Good morning. Uh, it's very good to welcome you to St. James's Church uh, Bushy on this Sunday morning uh, when we celebrate the patronal festival of this church, the Feast of St. James in our Eucharist. It's very good to welcome you here to worship. I'm here with uh, the Reverend Andy Burgess, uh, our curate and deacon, and he was just reflecting with me just now that uh, through the uh, miracle of technology, the signal that uh, goes out from my laptop as I speak to you goes uh, to the Zoom servers, which are in China. Uh, somehow Christian in Frankfurt gets involved also. It goes back to Andy in his uh, earpieces. And as he speaks, it goes off to China again. And uh, there's this extraordinary uh, thing of communication that goes around the world twice before it uh, reaches you, where you are. But as Christians, what we know and what we reflect on is that in worship, we have a, a connection with, if you like, a network which is much larger than that, which is cosmic rather than global because through Christ's mediation, we come into the very presence of God. And as the liturgy says uh, later on, we worship with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Hope you sense that as we gather today. Uh, really pleased to have the participation of James Mooney Dutton, our music director. You heard him playing the organ later on. And he and our virtual choir contribute also to the service uh, later on. We are in the uh, stage of our life as a church where we're taking baby steps towards the uh, resumption of worship in our buildings. And I'm pleased to remind you that uh, the church buildings are open for private prayer. St. James's on Mondays and Thursdays, uh, Holy Trinity on Wednesdays, uh, St. Paul's on Fridays, that's from 9.30 to 11 o'clock. And you are most welcome to come along and say your prayers and make your reflections. My colleague, Father Tim, this afternoon is doing 12 laps of the churchyard, uh, 12 apostles, 12 laps of the churchyard, uh, and uh, he's asking for sponsorship uh, for that, for uh, fundraising for our church. Uh, there are instructions, I think, on the website about how to do that. Next week will be our first public worship, uh, or at least our first Sunday public Eucharist from this church. Uh, again, you're warmly invited to come and join us uh, here in, in the real space. And there will be a form on the website. You're asked if you would be kind enough just to register and indicate that you're coming there, because of course we do have some limitations on numbers so we can maintain social distancing. And the last thing to say is just to remind you that there is a Choral Evensong tonight, which is coming to you on our Facebook page and uh, on YouTube. So you're asked to come and join that. Again, we have lovely input from the choir uh, with that service and uh, people contributing with readings and prayers in all sorts of ways. So as we begin our worship, then we have the opportunity to join in with our hymn, Rejoicing God's Saints Today and All Days.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We run the race set before us, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, bringing them to Jesus in penitence and faith. We confess together. Almighty God, long suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart, my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts I have done to others and the good I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you and raise me to newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. whose holy apostle St. James, leaving his father and all that he had, was obedient to the calling of your son Jesus Christ and followed him even to death. Help us, forsaking the false attractions of this world, to be ready at all times to answer your call without delay, through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, 
who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At that time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. The disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Alleluia, alleluia. I have called you friends, says the Lord. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked a favour of him. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Walking around the late morning congregation who had gathered for little Harry's baptism and greeting people, I catch sight of Adge, who I sort of know a bit. Hello, Adge, I say, how are you? What's brought you here today? Are you related to Harry's family? Yeah, says Adge. Harry's dad, Matt, is my brother. He's my youngest and shortest brother. Oh, okay. How many brothers have you got? I ask curiously. Oh, just the one. I think for a moment and then my remorseless logic kicks in. So I guess he's also your 
oldest and tallest brother then, I reply. Adge pauses and frowns suspiciously at me. Oh, R. I suppose he is. Well, it's neither Adge nor Matt that we have in view today, but James, James the Apostle, who, of course, had a brother, John. What do we remember about James? I guess, first of all, that he was one of the first disciples noticed and called by Jesus. So, from St. Mark, a reminder, as he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So James was a fisherman with a brother. And the story doesn't mention any other brothers, so in all probability, John was both the youngest and the shortest, but also the oldest and the tallest brother. <laughs> On the question of stature, this James is known in tradition as James the Great. There is another apostle, of course, James the Less, and the titles refer to their height rather than to their moral or spiritual stature. The other James, James the Less, is, according to scholars, rather more difficult to pin down. He's known in different Gospels as James the son of Alphaeus and also as James the brother of Joseph. And it's thought that these two were the same. And it's known also that there was a James who was the leader of the Jerusalem spoke, church spoken of in Acts and uh, he perhaps also is the same man. It may be that this other James is also the writer of the epistle James, but the identifications according to the brain boxes are uncertain. So we're on much surer ground with our James, with James the Great. So the third thing to say about him is that he was martyred, as you will have heard from our first reading in the Acts. The first of Jesus 12 to give up his life for his faith. And in our first reading, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. Now, in an open and largely tolerant society, and one in which Christianity has been the established religion for centuries, where our story has become part of the cultural wallpaper, so to speak, we're rather distanced from martyrs. And I suspect we're a bit queasy about them. They seem so extreme. And the C of E is anything but extreme. The Church of England, by and large, is much more tea and cake than it is flaying and martyrdom. And, you know, I quite like tea and cake, by the way, so I'm not knocking it. Uh, but we could be forgiven uh, for an observation from an outsider that that seems very central to a way of life. But tea and cake, really, you know, it's not a matter of life or death. But carrying the label of Christian might just be, not only back then, but now. Even in this century, this millennium, particularly in this new millennium, Christians in Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, China, Many places are being persecuted and losing their lives for the faith. So it's not just about tea and cake. Let's go back to the brothers and the question of stature, because the other thing in Scripture, the other important st story in Scripture about St. James is this rather unflattering one that we just heard from the Gospel about James and John's mother trying to get Jesus to put them in the top jobs. Actually, there are two different versions of the story in different uh, Gospels. And in Mark, I believe it is, uh, James and John come to Jesus themselves with the request. But here, it's their mum. She wants for them the top jobs in the new government. Jesus, you see, was always banging on about the kingdom of God. And back in the day, that would have been understood in political, this-worldly terms. And not entirely wrongly, I might add. And so as Jesus preaches the kingdom, mum dreams that James and John will become the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Home Secretary in this new kingdom. Kneeling before them, she asked a favour of him. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. So we're talking now about status rather than stature. 
The brothers, or perhaps their mother, aspire to high status, to have power and influence, to garner the admiration of others, to have their names and faces known, to command respect wherever they go. Now, the desire for esteem and affection is really common. It's not a rare pathology. And so is the desire for power and control. Many, many of us will have esteem and affection or power and control as one of our principal drives. I don't exclude myself, by the way, usually because we've been deprived of one of these things at an earlier period in our lives. So with this story then, we're in pretty universal human territory. There's nothing strange or alien about that desire for affection or esteem or power and control. Uh, indeed, they can go wrong, but they're part of what we naturally want and are met the way we're made as human beings. Affection and esteem, power and control, or just prominence, just being at the top of the pecking order. He's my youngest and shortest brother. But in the context of the gospel story, this is an unbelievable request. Just a moment ago, Jesus has taught that the last will be first and the first will be last because the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. God rewards those who are prepared to live for something bigger than their own ego needs. He casts down the mighty from their thrones and lifts up the lowly you remember. Just a breath ago, Jesus has been focusing on his own imminent suffering and death at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees, and now declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom? Unbelievable! Jesus is neither outraged nor annoyed by the request, but patiently picks up the opportunity to return to what he has only a moment ago been speaking of. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We could read between the lines of his response something like this. Are you really sure you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? You see, this thing about greatness, this thing about your stature in my kingdom is not about status. It's about how much you want to follow me. It's about how much you want to build a society in which the vulnerable are taken care of. The excluded ones are welcomed. The damaged ones healed. The guilty forgiven. The powerless discovering their own agency. And it's about how much you're prepared to stick up for that and to suffer for people and with me for the sake of that. Can you drink the cup that I am about to drink? It's a curious expression. Biblically, the cup is an image for the judgment of God. It appears in the Psalms and Isaiah, but it's clear from the context of the gospel here that what Jesus will suffer immediately is the wrath of the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the secular and religious authorities to whom he and his preaching of the coming kingdom are a threat. The cup of suffering which Jesus will drink is the cross on which he will suffer and die for the sins of the world. And his question to James and John is, can you do this with me? Can you really? Yes, we can, is their all too easy reply. And what we know is that like their friend Peter, when it came to it at Gethsemane, they fled. We don't know very much else about James the Great, but we do know, as I remarked earlier, that he ended up as a martyr. So between the running away and the martyrdom, there's some kind of transformation, some kind of deep change and reorientation the person who becomes the first martyr among the 12 is by that point utterly fixed, utterly rooted in his attachment to Jesus. Do you know what? That's what happens when we walk with Jesus through our flaky and unreliable moments, through our professions of loyalty and our abject failures, through our deep desire to be with Christ and then our blowing it once again. Through all of this, the life of Jesus and the character of Jesus takes root in us. 
It just does, because our Christian faith is real. And the ordinary practice of it, saying grace at the table, saying our prayers, reading our Bible, going to church, receiving the sacrament, these ordinary things connect us with the greatest power in the universe, the divine love poured out for us on the cross of Jesus. It's called sanctification, the process of becoming a saint. And for most of us, it's not going to get as far in this life as, the, as it did for James, but it is real and it's glorious because inside the clay jars of our humanity, as Paul puts it, there is a treasure of faith which can become more and more precious and shine more and more brightly as our lives unfold. We begin with wonder and gratitude to get it. And then, you know, we don't need the places at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in glory. It's enough just to be with him. And it doesn't matter, even if we're the youngest and the shortest. Amen. Let us profess together the faith of our baptism. Do you believe and trust in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for our fellowship in the household of faith with all those who have been baptised in your name. Keep us faithful to our baptism and so make us ready for that day when the whole creation shall be made perfect in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry, Greg, I think your microphone's on mute on the headset. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Ah, okay. May the Spirit pray through us as we try to put into words the longings of our hearts for the church and for the world. Father, we thank you for all who have helped us to pray and to grasp something of your great love and power. We ask your blessing and empowering for all who teach and minister in your name. We ask for our Sunday worship to be an overflowing of our daily walk with you, an expression of our deepening love. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. Father, we thank you for the beauty and diversity of the created world we inhabit. We ask for the wisdom to tend it carefully respecting the natural laws and sharing the resources, listening to the weak as well as the strident, the poor as well as the affluent and powerful. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. Father, we thank you for the candor and innocence of the very young and for the joy of friendship for all with whom we share our daily life and those we love but seldom meet. We ask for hearts that are skilled in listening so that we discern and respond to the real agendas as a re and remember that a conversation is a two-way event. Lord, hear us. 
Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we thank you for the advances in medical knowledge and the hope of new treatments for many diseases, especially the coronavirus. We pray for all in medical research and all whose lives are crippled or disadvantaged by illness, frailty or damage. Give comfort and reassurance, healing, wholeness and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we call to mind all those we have known and loved, who lived among us and have now died. We pray for all who made that journey unnoticed and alone. We ask that they may all know your mercy and the everlasting peace and joy of heaven. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we thank you for your wisdom and truth, your understanding and generosity. We acknowledge our total dependence on you and praise you for providing us with all we need. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sandy. Um, the risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Lord be always with you. And also with you. And you may want to uh, share a sign of the peace now by giving a wave if you're on Zoom. Uh, or if you're following along on Facebook, uh, a comment or a, an emoji or something like that, as we share the peace together. Peace be with you. Father, accept all we bring before you this day. Guide us with your love and feed us at your table as you nourish the faith of the church by the preaching of your apostles. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things. We were sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks for your blessings on this house of prayer, where through grace we offer to you this sacrifice of praise and are built by your spirit into a temple made without even the body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood your son, Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. So, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup. and We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve. Send your Holy Spirit among your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of St. James, the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread.
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his Son. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed.
Lord God, the source of all truth and love, keep us faithful to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, united in prayer and in the breaking of bread, one in joy and simplicity of heart in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The final hymn, we rejoice together. keep you. Amen. Amen. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. Amen. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. The Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, guard you and save you and bring you to the heavenly city where he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.